or source of security. I talked about uh, electronic chemicals in the context of uh, mobile phones and uh, laptop computers and so many other things. Personal care, home and personal care products. So yesterday morning I was hosting the new R&D director for Unilever, a chap called Mike Butler, who's um, part of the new wave in Unilever, driven, motivated by their CEO. Um, and he was talking about Unilever's vision. And a lot of their products, of course, are home and personal care as well as food and so on. And they were talking, like a lot of these companies, about the differences they're going to make in terms of reducing waste, in terms of improving resource efficiency, in terms of generally greening up their products, driven a lot by consumer demand and so on. Very exciting. It's amazing how many, in fact, I can't think of any major companies now, certainly in my area of existence, that aren't already talking now about these things. And that's pretty. That's really in the last year or so this has all happened. And I'm a great believer in one CEO starts, says something, another one follows, and so on. It's great, you know, it's like a catalytic effect. And it sort of causes all these people to... And so people are moving in this direction, which for me is very, very exciting. So all sorts of interesting issues there, all sorts of interesting requirements for chemicals. But the problem is that, you know, although it says good news for chemists, question mark, so good news in the sense that we need chemicals for everything, good news in the sense that more and more people want those articles and therefore the chemicals, but actually... Is it good news for chemists? Well, the problem is that each and every one of those articles also carries an issue which is chemical related. So, for example, the fabric. So you're wearing clothes of all sorts of different colors here, as I am. You know, I like my blue tie. But the chances are it was dyed in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is responsible for about 50% of all the dyeing of fabrics that uh, are sold in the European Union. Now, if you go to Bangladesh, you'll see the situation there is not fun, you know? because they don't have very adequate uh, waste treatment processes. So to them, it's not so much utilizing the waste. That's maybe a bit further on. They've got much more fundamental issues about the waste they're generating and where it goes. And it's going into the local rivers. So the pH in the local rivers is incredibly high. And one of the uh, causes of that is they've got the highest incidence of stomach ulcers in the world. So, you know, there's all sorts of real things going on, which we are not so aware of. So when I talk to some of the um, retailers, like Marks and Spencers and so on, about this, and they say, okay, we will send, we will make sure that when our buyer goes out to these places, they'll have a checklist, and on the checklist, among the usual things, they'll also say, do you have a waste treatment plant? And they do have this now on their checklist, but what they don't ask is, is it switched on? So actually, you'll find they have them, but they don't switch them, you know, so, so these are, but people are waking up H&M, I believe, are beginning now to recognize this, and working with, for example, some of my colleagues in the Stockholm Environment Institute to try and address this, so that's an issue. Pharmaceuticals. Now, you know, nobody thinks pharmaceuticals are an environmental problem, do they? I mean, it's like, you know, but they're great, aren't they? They cure our headache. They, they save us from horrible illnesses. They're fantastic. Well, actually, you know, they represent some of the worst cases of green chemistry. So what I talked about before, the friedel crafts reaction, if you remember that, about when at the end of the reaction you dump it all into water and create huge amounts of waste. So when you do that, what you're doing is you're making more waste than product. And most chemical manufacturing makes more waste than product. And we can, they can do it because there's enough money in it, basically, to do that. Pharmaceuticals, the average resource efficiency in pharmaceutical manufacturing is 1%. 1%. In other words, they make 99 times more waste than product. And they know it. And it's because they're making very complicated molecules. I'm not saying they're doing it because they're bad guys. They're doing it because the chemistry is complicated. But also, to be fair, because the product value is so high that they could still afford to make and make so much waste. Now, they're aware of this now. And for example, this, talking about CEOs, the CEO of GSK, Andrew Whitty, who I think is a very inspirational guy, he recognizes this, and he's actually set his company targets to improve that substantially. And I've been to a couple of his sustainability days in GSK, and the effect on at least some of the workforce is, is, is fantastic. You know, it really is inspiring people to think about this big picture-wise. So that's very encouraging. The other interesting thing about pharmaceuticals, by the way, is the fact that they are getting into the environment in a way that we don't necessarily want. So, for example, I was giving a talk in Paris recently, very nice location in the Louis Pasteur Institute, and talking about issues around so-called eco-pharmacovigilance, which is all about monitoring pharmaceuticals in the environment. And did you know, if you have 100 grams of muscles from the Seine, you're having the equivalent of one birth control pill. Did you know that if you turn on the tap water here, I can guarantee it, we could analyze and detect paracetamol? You know, this is the reality now. We are consuming such enormous quantities of pharmaceuticals. They are leaking into the environment. 
And this is known, and some of the governments are now beginning to react to this and worry about it, and the pharmaceutical companies are also looking at this, because it's not them, it's us. You know, they're the, we're the ones who buy the pharmaceuticals, get them prescribed to us, go home, consume some of them, then what do we do with the rest? In the bathroom cabinet, where do your unused pharmaceuticals go? If you're in the US, they tell you to flush them down the toilet. Problem is that the sewage treatment works aren't really necessarily good enough to cope with these things. These are complicated molecules, and even if they do break down, they probably generate other intermediates which are bioactive and might cause environmental damage. So this is a reality which people are waking up to. But you could say, and maybe I would say as well, the risk-benefit analysis is okay. Because pharmaceuticals provide so much benefit, maybe the risk of having small amounts getting into the environment because we're never 100% efficient is acceptable. It's a public debating point we should think about. And maybe it depends on the drug. In the same way, it depends upon the product. So for example, here, you see, you know, the one at the top middle there is the great blight of society, or so people think, the plastic bag. You know, the poor little plastic bag has become a cursed thing in society. It's extraordinary. You know, a few years ago, people were quite happily using plastic bags and appreciating them at checkout in supermarkets to put their groceries in, rejoicing at the fact that the technology to make a modern plastic bag is so fantastic, and this is chemistry, that they're so tough that a really thin bag, you can walk to the car now and it doesn't break open. And many of you will remember, not many years ago, walking to the car, you guarantee the bloody thing would break open and there goes all your groceries on the floor. But that doesn't happen now because the technology is so good. The resource efficiency of making a plastic bag is fantastic. It really is superb. You can't challenge it or at all. It's not the resource that's a concern, really. It's not the manufacturing, certainly. It's, the, it's not the product. It's the end of life. It's what we do with plastic bags. And there you've got a plastic bag, you know, which does the risk-benefit work out when actually we use a plastic bag for an average of 30 minutes in Western society and the lifetime in the environment is 400 years? You know, that just doesn't make sense at all. We're being fundamentally stupid by designing things that actually are great for application but have no consideration of end-of-life issues. Now, okay, absolutely, if we can recycle those bags, it could be okay. But how often, how efficient are we recycling? I'll come back to that in a moment. The answer is not very well. So it's very interesting, the plastic bag, but the consequences of this are dramatic. I mean, I was in Shanghai recently, where, of course, they banned the plastic bag. So, you know, depending on where you are in the world, Ireland taxed it, you know, some of the UK stores. So you go into Marks and Spencers and they kind of, you really want a plastic bag, sir? You know, it's like, oh, okay. So the guilt factor's there. Depending on where you are, different reactions. If you're in Japan, they're just so incredibly efficient at capturing the waste, waste management, recycling, and so on. In China, they banned the plastic bag overnight. And the Chinese plastic bag company closed down over one weekend. And I was in Shanghai not long after that, and I was at a 7-Eleven type store buying some stuff. And he looked at me, saw as a foreigner, and said, would you like a plastic bag, sir? And pull one from under the counter. Oh, wow, it's an illicit good, you know. And he made me sort of carry it inside my coat so no one could see it. Look, this is fantastic, you know. So this is extraordinary, you know, the poor plastic bag. But actually, the reality is it's a problem. And we saw pictures yesterday demonstrating this with regards to the amazing, you know, quantity of plastic uh, collected now in the Pacific and so on, and the environmental harm that caused. Absolutely. That is wrong. Plastic has got fantastic applications for many things. But for a 30-minute lifetime plastic bag, I don't think so. You need to think again there about the product. Okay, let's move on. So this is the consequence of all this, because people are concerned about chemical issues. They're concerned about chemicals in the environment. They're concerned about manufacturing, generating waste and pollution and all that sort of stuff. So therefore, you get all these pressures. Whoops, sorry, that's gone too quickly. You get all these pressures coming into place. And we've got at the far end the stuff that you will all recognize because this is all you. This is all the consumers putting pressure on the retailers. And the consequences of all that are that we have a lot of legislation. There's been an exponential growth in legislation affecting chemicals in the last 10 years. Dramatic. And there's one that some of you will know called REACH, which is Registration, Evaluation, Authorization of Chemicals, the most powerful chemical legislation the world has ever seen, and created in the EU. We should be proud of it. We spent, yeah, we spent, the chemical industry spent years fighting it because they thought it was going to destroy the industry. And then somebody I remember a couple of years ago from, I think it was IKEA, stood up and said, well, actually, in the future, we're only going to source chemicals that are REACH-proof. So suddenly people began to realize there could be market advantage in this. It goes back to economic value of doing all this. There can be economic value because people would prefer to have chemicals in their products which have been tested and proven by legislation like REACH. 
And I just read the other day, there's now reached China. China has copycatted this and produced something very similar. And actually, the Chinese are now looking across to the Americans and saying, you're behind us in all this, and it's wonderful. You know? So the competition is now becoming international with different companies saying, we're ahead of you. California was amazing. You know? I was in a meeting in Frankfurt about three years ago, and somebody I know from California, from uh, the, the governor's office, came rushing in and said to me, oh, and he's passed the first green chemistry bill, and the first ever green chemistry bill was passed by the Terminator, which I thought was just fantastic. You know? So he's on our side as well. And all the way back, the manufacturing problems I talked to you about before have all caused enormous pressures through legislation and other factors, cost factors. And then we have the raw materials. And this is where I spend a lot of my time these days, because not forgetting the manufacturing, all I said before, is essential. Not forgetting the final product and reuse and so on, so essential. But, you know, this is all a life cycle thing to me. And you've got to, therefore, start at the beginning, which is the resource. And it's the resource, really, where there's a lot of really, really interesting geopolitical stuff going on, which I'll be showing you various examples of as I go through my talk. So let's start here. So in a while, I'm going to talk about carbon, because everybody talks about carbon, which is fair enough, because it's so important. But don't forget the other elements. So this is data that we haven't quite published yet, except it appeared in Le Monde, the French newspaper, about two weeks ago which amazed us, actually, but Le Monde picked up on it and published a half-page spread in their main newspaper, which was great. Eventually, it'll be published in the Chemical Engineering Journal. But what it shows you is it shows you data, the best data we could find, which talked about the availability of elements going forward into the future. So basically, what we've got is we've got a number of elements highlighted in red where, based on known reserves and current rate of consumption, that's how long there is to last, and basically not long. Now, that, even that data is worse, actually, because that's a few years out of date. And it doesn't include some elements like lithium, for example, which we're now using in enormous quantities for batteries. It also would make some of those yellow ones, the ones at the bottom, which are called the rare earths. Now, you may have read about the rare earths because people are now beginning to panic about the rare earths because, for example, every Toyota Prius contains two kilograms of rare earths in its battery. Wind turbines use huge amounts of rare earths in their, in their, ba in their construction. It's kind of ironic that the clean technologies we're developing actually are consuming elements, and elements we haven't really used much before at an alarming rate. And I don't see a lot of evidence that people are really picking up on this. It's beginning now to twig. So I'll show you some data in a moment that makes people realize that actually this is getting serious. And so uh, I know that some of the British embassies around Europe are getting together to try and start a workshop. I know the Dutch and the Belgians are looking at this very seriously. And I know the Japanese certainly are looking at it very seriously. So it's beginning to happen now that people are beginning to think, hang on a second, these elements are running out. Now, those ones in red, a lot of those gallium, indium, tin, germanium, they are essential to electronics. If we had none of those, forget electronics, forget televisions, computers, the internet, gone. Mobile phones, no chance. This is the reality, you know? There's an awful lot of other applications for those elements as well. You don't even see because they're used within the processes that make the products, like pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals use enormous quantities of palladium, which actually there is in white, which looks okay, but in fact, the more recent data will show it going yellow. And people are also using platinum, like in catalytic converters, for example. All sorts of applications there you don't necessarily think about, but they're embedded in society. And we're just using up these elements and it basically, as Michael said yesterday, of course, what we do is we use them, we take them out of the virgin source, we use them, then we throw them away, and they get dispersed in the environment. We don't lose them. It's not like carbon, where it can go in the atmosphere. Most of these elements don't have a gaseous component in their own life cycles. They stay in the ground, but we move them into places we don't know how to access. And this is where the residual ones are, by the way. This is why some of the geopolitical